who used the illustration of a hospital nursery. And she said, um, just to imagine these lines as bassinets uh, lined up in a hospital nursery. Uh, it's been a busy night, lots of kids born. And here's the nurse's station. And the evening nurse is on duty and she comes out and she begins checking on kids, making sure that they are fed, diapers changed, things like that. And this particular nurse really has a thing about little blonde haired, blue eyed baby boys. She thinks they're just irresistible. And sure enough, as she's going around, she finds this little blonde haired, blue eyed baby boy. And she can't, just can't resist the urge just to stop and talk to him a little bit, play with him. Pretty soon she tears herself away and she goes on and finds a couple of other kids who need different things. And then she heads back to the nurse's station and she just can't resist the urge just to stop one more time and play with this kid. Gosh, he's a cute little kid. And she goes back to the nurse's station. That evening, she goes, next morning, she goes off duty, and the morning nurse comes on duty. And the morning nurse also begins to make her rounds, checking on various kids needing uh, different things. And as she's making her rounds, she also discovers this little blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby boy. Um, this particular nurse really prefers girls, um, and especially little girls with red hair. She just thinks they're adorable. And, um, but she also notices this little blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby boy. He's not a girl, and he doesn't have red hair, but gosh, he's a cute little kid. And she can't resist the urge just to stop and talk to him a little bit, play with him. Finally, uh, she goes on, and she also finds this little girl with uh, red hair. Um, and she just um, picks this child up, uh, fawns over her, really excited about her. Pretty soon she goes off duty and um, the afternoon nurse comes on duty and this afternoon nurse really has a thing about little babies with cold black hair and black eyes. She thinks they are just incredible. And sure enough as she's making her rounds she finds um, a child who has little a uh, little kid who has coal black hair and black eyes. And she can't resist her just to stop and talk to him and play with him and uh, so forth. And then she goes on and finds other kids who need things. And uh, she also notices this little blonde haired, blue eyed baby boy. You know, he doesn't have black hair, he doesn't have black eyes, but gosh, he's a cute little baby. And she stops and talks to him and plays with him a little bit. And then finally she goes back to the nurse's station and the cycle repeats. You know, the evening nurse comes on duty and so on. And this goes on for about three days, and then the kids go home. And I'd like for you next to imagine a first grade classroom. You know, it's been a few years, and um, this is the new crop of students. This is the teacher's desk. And she looks out over this new group of students and these kids are all smiling. This guy has a really big smile on his face. Um, these kids sometimes smile, sometimes don't. These kids are kind of neutral. These kids all have frowns. And she says to herself, aha, obviously these are the brighter kids. Uh, look how responsive they are. Whenever she asks a question, these kids are always first to raise their hands. This kid comes up out of his seat wanting to answer the question. Uh, these kids sometimes raise their hand, sometimes they don't. Uh, these kids don't raise their hand, but they will answer when she calls on them. And these kids <clears throat> don't raise their hand, um, they don't answer when she calls on them. And she's constantly having to yell back at them to stay in their seat, to stop throwing spitballs, to stop pulling each other's hair, and things like that. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, as they go through uh, the years, uh, demically, 
These are the kids who will make the higher grades. This kid will often become valedictorian of his class. Um, these kids will mostly go to college. These kids will go to trade schools. These kids will drop out as soon as possible. And it has almost nothing to do with intelligence. It has to do with the pattern of stroking they developed very early and became familiar with. There is um, an excellent article that was written up in both uh, Psychology Today and in Scientific American about a group of psychologists who went into a school system and they took all the progress reports from the previous years and the kids who were really the exceptional kids, the bright kids, the fast learners and high achievers and so forth, they told next year's teachers, we're really sorry to have to tell you this, but these are the dull kids, the kids who are slow learners, have real difficulty, you'll be lucky if you can teach them anything this year. They took all the kids whose previous progress reports said that they were the slow learners, the dull kids, and so forth. And they told next year's teachers, you'll be amazed by the work these kids do. You are so lucky to have them. They are incredible. You'll be lucky if you can even keep up with them. In one year's time, the two groups totally reversed their performance. Based on nothing else than, other than what the teacher expected, looked for, and stroked in the kids. Now that's how powerful stroking is. It is the most powerful determinant of our behavior. Claude Steiner used to use the analogy of being given an air mask at birth and the parents say, I'll turn it on if you do what I want. And you can imagine how powerful that would shape their behavior. Stroking is equally powerful because the kid's survival really is at stake. There are also different uh, messages conveyed by the pattern of stroking that uh, kids get. If we think about getting strokes for doing uh, versus getting strokes for being, there are several patterns that you will see. One is where kids get positive strokes for doing and few or negative strokes for being. And the message in that pattern of stroking um, is don't be a child. Hurry up, grow up, achieve, be active. And so when, as long as the kid is doing something, he feels good about himself. Um, when he's not, um, he uh, doesn't know what to do with himself. So he tends to stay busy and achieve because that's how he's learned to get strokes. And often in social situations where he doesn't have something to do, he feels a little awkward and unnatural and has difficulty feeling like he fits in. A second pattern is when kids get negative strokes or few strokes for doing and positive strokes for being. They feel conditionally okay. They feel okay as long as they're just being cute and sweet and entertaining and uh, loving and so forth, but when they start to do something, uh, they uh, don't feel very competent. Because as kids, their parents said, oh, don't worry about that. Here, let daddy do it for you. Don't worry your pretty little head about that. And they were never given recognition and attention for achievement, for doing. So the message in that pattern of stroking is don't grow up. Stay my sweet little cuddly kid that I can appreciate and enjoy. So both of these are conditional patterns of stroking. One is conditioned on doing, the other is conditioned on being. There are some kids who get negative strokes for both. They get negative strokes for doing, they get negative strokes for being. So 
uh, they don't feel a bit good about themselves just the way they are, and there's nothing they can do to really make that different. The message in that pattern is don't be or don't exist. Basically, you have no worth or value and no right to be here. Obviously, the healthy pattern is positive strokes for doing and for being so that kids feel both lovable and feel competent. <clears throat> Those are both unconditional patterns of uh, stroking, either unconditionally negative or unconditionally positive. And again, uh, we need a few negative strokes for doing in order to let us know where the boundaries are. But again, a ratio of about 5 to 1 is important in terms of feeling good about ourselves. So each of these patterns will tend to shape the child's behavior in a certain way. Any questions about those? Mm -hmm. The doing and being I have seen in the people that I work with, um, a man who has been like an athlete mm -hmm. or has performed and now he's getting to be 40 or something, he can no longer perform that. Right. He has no identity. He has no nothing. Right. Conversely, a woman who has existed on just being beautiful mm -hmm. and she hasn't really had to develop other parts of her life because she's gotten by being beautiful right and then uh, and all the riches that are given to her for that and then she also gets to be 40 45 right and her beauty starts to cease or to be lessened Baby. yes and then now she's left with she doesn't know how to cope with life because she hasn't had to right is your that's your experience also exactly yeah and it's amazing how how many men retire and have heart attacks because they don't know what to do with themselves. They don't have know how to have a, a sense of worth or value because they've never learned how to do that and apart from achieving. Yeah. In looking at strokes, um, would it be considered a stroke to give somebody a gift mm -hmm. or would it be considered a stroke to do something for someone like cook yes. them a meal? So would that fall into the category of physical stroke or? It'd be a positive stroke. I mean, those are both ways of giving positive recognition. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, continuing her question. So having uh, strokes, for example, if you have doing and being strokes since your ch childhood until some age, uh, maybe it's not enough. For a person, no. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Your I mean that. Is there a question? Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean that. Uh, so you cannot be very confident if you give both of these things to your child, for example. About it, the being and doing all the time, giving this kind of stroke to a child. Uh, if it is you can feel enough, confident. yeah. If yes. it is enough, or sometimes you have to do. Uh, some negative strokes also and some negative strokes for being and doing? Uh, in most cases, if kids are getting sufficient positive strokes for both, uh, they do very well. Again, it, it's usually when they can't get them in a particular area that they go after the negative. There's a psychologist in Tucson Arizona, um, uh, who's named, um, what is his name, uh, Howard Glasser. No, Howard, yeah, Howard Glasser. He's wrote, written a book called Transforming the Difficult Child. And he said he's never had a child, regardless of their diagnosis, ADHD, um, oppositional defiance, behavioral conduct disorder, whatever, that he couldn't turn around in two weeks or less. And he said um, 
these kids are no fools. They know where the intensity is and they go after it. And if you provide more intensity and more stroking in a positive, he didn't use the term stroke, but basically that's what he's talking about. If you provide more attention and intensity in a positive direction than in a negative direction, kids will turn around just like that. And the most it's ever taken him is two weeks. He teaches the teachers and the parents how to provide more intensity in a positive direction. Um, because usually the, the most intense strokes are negative. Um, I highly recommend his book. He also has some DVDs just demonstrating his work. And it's a very powerful demonstration of this. It's called Transforming the, the Difficult Child. Yes, Will. Two quick questions. One, what age limit does that elasticity cease to exist? I'm thinking about in a work environment with difficult team members, how you stroke them positively, and it's, uh, it might take more than two weeks, but um, do you think that elasticity still exists? And then also, what was the phrase that went along with positive doing, negative being? I, I got the other phrases. Um, negative doing, positive being was don't grow up. Negative, negative was don't exist, but I didn't get the first one. The first one is don't be a child. Don't be a child. Yeah. Very good. Uh, what we've learned, uh, what we've learned more recently from brain research, is we retain plasticity all our lives. We used to think that only children had uh, plasticity of the brain, but now uh, what we know is we retain that throughout our lives. The difficulty is, uh, you know, in a work environment, people have learned certain patterns and they rely on those, and they do them unconsciously. Uh, but one of the things Howard Glasser talks about is providing video moments, going around and simply commenting on what you see people doing. Like in school, the teacher might say, oh, Johnny, I've seen what you've done with that green crayon. Fantastic. Way to go. I'll be around in a minute to see what you do with the red one. Now, that's a video moment. The teacher is just reflecting back uh, what the child is doing in a way that the child feels good about and feels recognition. And so that child is not likely to act out as a way of getting attention because he's getting it automatically even before he does something. Um, he also advocates that when ch children make mistakes um, that it be a simple corrective like whoops, bummer, made a mistake, time out, and it's less than a minute. And then the child gets stroked for intensely for how well they did in timeout. You sat there and you didn't act out at all. Fantastic. Way to go. Now you can hear the intensity. I mean, you have to provide more intensity in a positive direction than in a negative direction. And kids will really turn around their behavior doing that. And I think employees would too, probably, over time, as they learned uh, that they could get that kind of recognition and uh, appreciation in a positive direction. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, I want to um, also talk a little bit about time structuring. Um, Byrne talked about how in situations where our time is not automatically structured for us, um, we feel a compulsion to structure time in some meaningful way. Uh, are there a couple of people here who would like to do an exercise just to get to know each other a little better? A couple of people willing to volunteer for that? Okay, here and here. If you'll come up, just bring it. Uh, actually, we have a chair up here you can use. And if you'll just turn your chair around. Okay, the situation is this. You're in a doctor's office waiting to be called in for your appointment. And you're sitting across the aisle from each other. And you can spend this time any way you want to. 
Hello, what's your name? I'm Tila, what's yours? I'm Alexandra. Have you been to this office before? Not really. I don't know this doctor. Have you? Yeah, I've been here a couple times and he seems really nice. He's really responsive and he'll listen to you when you ask questions. I'm just here for an annual checkup. You know, just... Oh, uh, well, how did you hear about him? A friend recommended him and, well, he seems pretty good, but, well, you know. I hear that you're new here and even though your friend recommended him, you're still not sure about him? Am I right saying that? Well, maybe not about him, but, like, if he can help me. Are you concerned about a problem you have? <laughs> yeah, that would make sense. <laughs> I had a blonde moment. <laughs> well, I wish you the best of luck. I mean, from my experience, he's really good, and still, I wish you the best of luck with him. And at what time? Um, he told me to get here by 2.15 to fill out some paperwork, and it's 2.30, and paperwork's long done, so I'm a little late for my, I guess he's running a little late today. Or is this new? Uh, this is the first time it's happened to me, and I assume he's busy. He's probably stayed on, on a little longer with one of his patients. Because usually, in my experience, doctors, like, are really late all the time, and they make you wait. <laughs> yeah, and you also can never read their handwriting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> you have to translate, or the pharmacist. Or... You need, like, a little, a little dictionary next to everything you write, saying, okay, this translates to this. Oh, he said and here. It looks like alphabetize. Well, but isn't it dangerous? I mean, they can mix up something. Well, I think that makes it a good thing that most things are digital now, so you can just type them out. Never known anyone with messy typing unless you count misspellings or those autocorrect mistakes that always get me on my phone. <laughs> this doctor used... You're right. He types everything up now. Like, they just switched to a new system, I think. The last time I was here, they were transferring the files over. And also, they're connected to the local pharmacy where they just send the <laughs> prescriptions over. Uh, Tina, the doctor will see you now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so given that kind of situation in the doctor's office, the dentist's office, uh, airport, uh, bus station, train station, situations like that where our time is not being structured for us automatically, we feel a compulsion to structure that time in some meaningful way. That's why people bring laptops, iPhones, novels, um, iPads, all kinds of things with them to... Um, uh, have activities to do and so forth in those situations. Uh, Byrne identified six basic ways of structuring time and I will list these in, in the order of the intensity of stroking involved and also the gr degree of psychological risk which refers to the risk of rejection. So as we go down the list we'll be increasing both the intensity of the stroking and the degree of psychological risk. The first way of structuring time is withdrawal, which these do, people didn't do very much. But oftentimes in a situation like that, people will wait and before they speak, or you know, they might withdraw into a book, or they might just withdraw into 
their mind and think about things or whatever. Um, withdrawal uh, is largely uh, involves self-stroking. We stroke ourselves internally, either positively or negatively, by what we think about. Um, but uh, the intensity of stroking is not very uh, much because we are basically self-stroking. And there's very little risk of psycho, you know, psychological risk, or risk of rejection, because we're not talking to people. A second basic way of structuring time are what are called rituals. And rituals are very prescribed behavior that everybody knows how to do. And you saw the people do, uh, do a ritual called a greeting ritual here. Hello, my name is uh, Taylor. My name is uh, Alexandra, uh, and so on. Uh, and in rituals, people keep very precise count of the strokes. So if I say hello, and you say hello, and I say how are you, and you don't respond, I feel cheated. I've given you two strokes and only gotten one back. So I may mutter something under my breath and walk on, uh, feeling offended. Rituals help us structure time um, in a well-known prescribed way where we really don't want maybe to get into an in-depth conversation with somebody. So we say, hi, how are you? Wanting them to say fine and not give us the details of their life. Um, there are also rituals in meetings like um, Robert's Rules of Order or church rituals or fraternal rituals. Uh, things like that, that everybody knows how to engage in. And so, if you're in a church, for example, you don't have to uh, figure out what to do each Sunday, you know, you, or whatever day the church meets on. Uh, people know the routine, what to, what to go through. Withdrawals are largely, withdrawal is largely a function of the child ego state. Rituals are largely a function of the parent ego state very precise, prescribed ways of interacting. And rituals involve a little more intensity of stroking. That is, it feels better you know, to be recognized by another person than just to stroke yourself. But there's also a little greater degree of psychological risk. If you say hello, the other person might not respond and turn away, as you experienced in the exercise earlier. A third form of structuring time is what's called pastimes. And pastimes are kind of light, superficial conversation that you use to get to know somebody else. They're the kinds of conversations we have at cocktail parties and social events. And the two people here went through some pastiming with each other in terms of, um, have you ever been to this dark doctor before? What is he like? Things like that. Uh, and in that process, you, you kind of get a sense of who the other person is and how they're going to respond and um, without risking a whole lot in that conversation. So there's more intensity of stroking, but a little greater degree of psychological risk in that the other person might disagree uh, with what you're saying and reject you. Um, the fourth way of structuring time are what are called activities. Activities are anything that result in a product. And uh, activities are pretty much a function of the adult ego state. Uh, and most of those strokes come at the end of the activity for a job well done or a job poorly done. There may be a few strokes along the way, like a progress report, but most of the stroking is at the end. Uh, pastimes can be a function of either parent or child. Parental pastimes are what Eric Byrne used to call PTA. Ain't it awful about the kids these days, how they're this way or that way. And um, child pastimes are talking about things you're excited about or like, like sports or hobbies or things like that. A fifth way of structuring time are what are called psychological games. And their games are played in three degrees, as we'll look at tomorrow. Uh, first degree, uh, an example would be the kind of light banter 
that we often engage in at work where there's not really the, the protection psychologically for being intimate. So we sort of tease and joke with one another and uh, playfully make fun of each other and things like that. And everybody knows that it's in good humor, so nobody really takes a lot of negative strokes from that. Um, so games can be useful in those situations to get strokes in a situation where uh, there's not the protection for a deeper level of connection and intimacy. Um, second degree games and third degree games are not productive in that they involve more intense negative payoffs in which we either feel bad or often experience very tragic outcomes like incarceration or tissue damage or things like that. The sixth way of structuring time is what is called intimacy and that's an open, honest, game-free relationship in which the strokes are lar largely unconditional. But intimacy also involves the greatest degree of psychological risk. Uh, the fear that people often have in engaging in intimacy is if I open myself up fully and show you completely who I am, you might say, yuck, and I would feel devastated. Um, most of us learn to feel bad when we're rejected in that way, but we don't have to. We could say, wow, you don't know what you're missing, and go find somebody who can really appreciate us. Um, but most people will feel bad if they are rejected um, in that way. Now all of these are useful ways of structuring time depending on the situation. And the goal is to be able to move through those uh, as needed and not get stuck in any way, any one way of structuring time. When you first come to an event like this, you probably withdraw initially and um, maybe uh, pick out a seat, get your notes ready and so forth, or papers to take notes. You may not really engage in conversation with another person uh, immediately, and then when somebody sits down next to you, you probably will engage in a greeting ritual and maybe some past timing, like have you ever been to a course like this? Um, you, uh, the activity that you're likely to engage in is the teaching learning process. And hopefully you will probably skip over games. And uh, through pastiming with other people, you get a sense of who you really feel connected with and want to establish a deeper, more intimate relationship with. So it's important to be able to move through all of these in terms of uh, getting the kinds of strokes, the intensity that we uh, want and need and avoid uh, feeling rejected by other people. Um, there are many behaviors that can be used in all of these different ways. Uh, for example, um, if you think about sex, you can withdraw and masturbate. You can have sex only on Saturday nights. Uh, you can spend a rainy Sunday afternoon. Uh, you can make babies. Uh, you can play sexual games like Rapo, where you lead somebody on and then reject them. Or you can be truly intimate uh, in uh, sexual activity. Um, oftentimes, people assume that sex is intimate, but that's not always true. People use sex in many different ways. And you, look, you can also look at other behaviors in the same way. People can do them from a number of these different positions. Um, any questions about time structure? Yes. For example, uh, hiking, regular physical exercise. Yes. Is that an activity? It can be if, that, if you're doing it for the purpose of exercise. If you're doing it for just pleasure and enjoyment, uh, it could be uh, simply a pastime. If you're doing it because you want to get away from people and have some time to yourself, it could be withdrawal. So. 
Other questions? One of the things Byrne pointed out is in group therapy, if you don't allow people to withdraw and uh, you uh, prevent uh, simply staying on a ritual level or pastiming, and um, you don't allow people to play games, the only two options left are activities, which is fulfilling therapeutic contracts in a, in a therapy group, or intimacy, which is healing in and of itself. So you can really help people uh, move in a positive direction by uh, limiting the way they structure time in a group. So again, these, you know, different behaviors can be used as different ways of structuring time. And it's helpful to know that all of them are appropriate and helpful in different contexts as ways of providing meaningful ways for spending your time and also getting the kinds of strokes that you want. Yes. From an organizational standpoint, I found that when people get laid off a job, mm -hmm. time structuring becomes incredibly important because their work has given them a lot of their time structuring guidelines. Right. You have a job yourself. Say it again. You, you have to do it for yourself. Right. And that can really confound some people. Right. Yes. And that's why uh, often people will seek out leaders. Again, Byrne talked about leadership hunger being um, a corollary of structure hunger. That um, when we um, are not good or don't have ideas for structuring our own time, we often look to leaders to provide that. Yes, tell me what to do. Direct me. But that could be a little dangerous if it's like a cult. That's leader, right. Right. That's right. Exactly. Any other questions or comments about Tom structuring? Okay, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's called position hunger. And that's a hunger to maintain the existential life position that we decided upon in childhood. And there are four of these that Byrne talked about. When, when kids get sufficient positive stroking, they feel okay about themselves in that they feel like they have worth, value, and dignity. And they feel like their parents have worth, value, and dignity, which gets generalized to other people. And so they feel a hunger to maintain that sense of okayness about themselves and having okay interactions with other people. This is the only position that's really based on reality. Because the reality is all of us have worth, value, and dignity as human beings. The rest of the positions are myths based on what we experienced growing up and the pattern of stroking we received. So one pattern of stroking, again, is getting uh, mainly negative strokes. Um, and when that happens, uh, we begin to feel not okay about ourselves. We feel like we're unlovable or don't have worth or value. And since our parents are the only models we have, we automatically assume that they're okay. So it feels like there's basically something wrong with me. Other people are okay, I'm not. And he called that the depressive position. Because those, that belief really leads to people feeling depressed. Feeling worthless, not having value.
when people get very brutal strokes, physical abuse, um, extreme verbal abuse, they often move to a position of uh, feeling like they're okay, the other person is the one who's not okay. Because they see other kids, and they see their parents interacting with them, and they notice they don't treat them that way. So they, they often move to a more defensive position of, it's not me, it's you. I gotta watch out for you to keep myself safe and protect myself. So I'm okay. You're not okay. And that's, a, again, a defensive position, sometimes referred to as a paranoid position. A fourth position is where kids are either struggled with constantly or uh, people uh, don't provide sufficient attention and recognition. The child begins to feel like, you know, there's something wrong with me because I'm not getting what I need here. But there's also something wrong with you because you're not providing me with what I need. So it feels like I'm not okay, but you're not okay either. And uh, that's called a position of despair or futility or hopelessness. If I'm not okay and you're not okay either, what hope is there for anything better? Now once the child has decided on one of these basic existential life positions, they have a certain degree of psychological hunger for maintaining that position. And um, people often think, well, why would somebody want to stay depressed or seek out a position in which they feel not okay? Well, these positions are very predictable. They make life predictable and well-known. There's lo very little anxiety. If I've been depressed all my life, I know how to act. I know how other people are going to react to me. I know what's going to happen over and over and over again in my life. So there's very little unknown. If I were suddenly to change and become happy, even though that sounds really good, I don't know how to act. I feel awkward and unnatural. I don't know how other people are going to react to me because I've never experienced that. I don't know what happens to happy people over time. So even though it's something that sounds like it would be a lot better, there are all kinds of anxieties and unknowns associated with that. And that's what defensiveness is and resistance in psychotherapy. People are often afraid to change because they don't know what's going to happen. And it's unknown, it's unpredictable, and they're a little anxious about taking that step. So they often find ways to sabotage themselves or thwart themselves from doing that. If I've grown up anxious, <clears throat> um, I know what that feels like. It's very familiar. And when I leave home, I can take my anxiety off to college with me and make college feel just like home. And then when I leave college and get a form a family, get married, form a family of my own, I can take my anxiety along with me and feel uh, in the new home just like I felt in the old home. So there's a certain amount of psychological security that's associated with what is well known and familiar, and a certain amount of anxiety that people feel in doing things a different way. And often people argue vehemently for tradition because they don't want to have changes because that's too anxiety producing. So there's a kind of built-in resistance uh, often in society to um, uh, a lot of change. The thing that can cut through that is natural child excitement. And often that is brought about by entertainment uh, venues like movies and theater and things like that. I think the movie Rocky got more people out jogging and running than all the health pamphlets ever produced. Because people saw Rocky's excitement when he climbed those stairs and got up to the park. 
top part, and you hear this triumphant music playing in the background. Um, so when people see things and experience things that they can identify with and be excited about, change becomes very easy. That's why it's so important in psychotherapy to help get people in touch with their natural child and to make therapy and ch the change process fun and enjoyable and exciting. Then you get very little resistance. So I think often more change is produced by movies and plays and things like that than uh, many other venues. Uh, Frank Ernst, who was again one of Burns' early students, uh, came up with a concept of what he called the OK Corral, which is kind of a hokey name, but it uh, provides some useful insights. What he did was to basically um, plot the, the OK positions on a quadrant <clears throat> with I'm OK at the right hand end of the quadrant. Uh, I'm not okay at the left side of the, of the horizontal axis. You're okay at the top, and you're not okay at the bottom, which produces four basic quadrants. And where people feel okay about themselves and okay about other people, uh, they tend to get on with life and look at how to produce the most exciting, fulfilling possibilities that are available for people in a certain situation. And that's looked at as the healthy position. And, and again, the only one that's really based on reality. If you take a position of okayness and you relate to other people as though they're okay, they will begin to act that way with you. It's empirically testable. Um, and that's uh, uh, extremely important position to operate from uh, as therapists or as parents or as bosses or educators or whatever. Because that's where you're going to get the most productive, healthy outcome for yourself and the other person in a situation. Franklin Ernst, who is a psychiatrist who was one of Burns' early students. Where people feel like uh, they're okay and other people are not okay, they often kind of box themselves into a very predictable outcome, which is trying to justify getting rid of other people. So they look for fault in other people, play blemish, take a defensive position often, because they are afraid of being hurt or... Uh, contaminated in some way if they deal with these people who are not okay. Where people feel like they're not okay and other people are, uh, Ernst called this the depressive position because a lot of their behavior goes into justifying trying to get away from other people. Because when they're around other people, they're reminded of their no own not okayness. So they often attempt to solve that by getting away from. When people feel not okay about themselves and not okay about other people, they excuse me, they often box themselves into a fairly predictable outcome, which is getting nowhere with other people. Uh, since that's a position of futility or despair or hopelessness, um, they often um, try to justify that position um, by sabotaging what's going on, you know, asking for help and rejecting the help that's offered, uh, feeling frustrated themselves and trying to invite other people into feeling frustrated with them. Uh, to prove to themselves that it's hopeless. And why bother or why try? Because uh, there's no hope anyway.
Now, there are typical behaviors you will see in each of these quadrants. Oops. Sorry. When people feel okay about themselves and okay about other people, they often feel excited or other positive feelings and they often engage in problem solving uh, to make the situation the most fulfilling for them and the other people involved. When people feel like they're okay and other people are not, they often look for fault in the other person. Uh, Byrne called that a game of blemish. Uh, another variation of that is now I've got you where they set people up to make mistakes so then they can point out their not okayness. And they use anger as a basic emotion. They stay angry because that invites people to get away. Um, it's a way of trying to get rid of other people. Um, as a result, they often feel a fairly joy joyless existence because they're not experiencing closeness and intimacy with other people. And they often turn to drugs, alcohol, sex, other ways of, of providing artificial stimulation as a way, as a substitute for intimacy. And um, the Gouldings, Bob and Mary Goulding, talked about escape hatches that people will use. Um, and the escape hatch, often in that position, um, in terms of the ultimate getting rid of somebody else, is homicide. Minor versions of that would be firing a not okay employee, divorcing a not okay spouse, um, in order to get rid of them and not have to be close. That behavior is, you know, what's driving that behavior, what's underneath all of the Anger and finding fault is scare in the child of feeling like they're going to get hurt if they really get close. When people feel okay about themselves and not okay about other people, they often uh, play kick me in order to justify their feelings of not okay. You know, they will do things, uh, make mistakes outside their awareness to invite other people to find fault with them. And the feelings they often maintain are scare, sadness, confusion, guilt, depression. Um, and because they're getting mostly negative feedback from other people uh, and outside their awareness and actually setting that up and inviting it, uh, they often feel like uh, they're not lovable. Uh, Claude Steiner talked about this as a loveless position. And their solution is then to run away or in the extreme to commit suicide. That would be the ultimate running away. Uh, and they often do that with the fantasy that other people are going to be sad and miss them when they're gone and feel guilty for how they treated them and so forth. The reality is once they're dead, they won't know how anybody feels about them. But that fantasy is often based on the magical thinking of the child of about four to six. When people feel not okay about themselves and um, not okay about other people, they often play the game called why don't you yes but, where they present a problem looking for solutions and no matter what anybody suggests, they yes but it and tell you why it won't work. So, you know, eventually people get frustrated and give up on them. And then they feel justified in their uh, despair and feelings of futility. Steiner called this a mindless position because basically the person is not using their adult ego state to problem solve. Um, they're often uh, playing games out of their parent or child to justify that the situation is hopeless. 
So they may stay in a job that's going nowhere and just vegetate or in a relationship that's going nowhere and just vegetate. The ultimate escalation of that position would be to go crazy and wind up in a mental institution with somebody else taking care of them. Yeah, Will, you had a question. I've got this terrible problem. Uh, my wife snores and I can't get any sleep. It's horrible. I, I lie awake many, many times at night. Well, why don't you try using earplugs? Yes, but I did that. I uh, got an ear infection. Had to go to the doctor. It cost me $100. It was horrible. Well, why don't you try rolling her over? Yes, but I did that. She woke up and slugged me. I got this big black eye. It was just terrible. Well, why don't you try sleeping in another room? Yes, but I did that. Uh, she accused me of not loving her anymore, not being faithful, almost ruined our marriage. Uh, and on and on like that. No matter what you suggest, the person will tell you why that won't work. Um, and so they continue to feel frustrated, and you get frustrated trying to help them. Yes. Ben, I, I love this model so far. There's something that's needling me about this piece of it, uh -huh. um, and that is I work with people who come out of uh, cultures of poverty or cultures where they feel um, like there's a cultural piece to it as well as the individual. Like, I'm okay, yes. you're okay, is the individuals, but then there are these cultural messages they get so that the defensiveness um, is part of their real-world experience. Right. So when, like, I... I understand the whole idea of this is reality, but the cultural messages don't match that. That's right. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering you, you how you get hold the that. same kinds of injunctions and uh, messages culturally that we get in our families. Our family is a culture also. So you see the same thing on a much larger scale where it makes it much more difficult to escape that unless you can move to a different culture. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Was there another question or comment? So, yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know that they can move if, if they're not able to move to another culture. So I'm wondering how you can hold the truth of the, the reality of the culture while also helping them to connect with the, the individual truth that we're all okay. Uh, I think through uh, giving them a different kind of experience, I think that's what happens in therapy with people who came out of very abusive, destructive families. Often, uh, the therapeutic relationship is the first that they've ever experienced where they can truly experience uh, feeling okay about themselves. And um, I think you can do that on a cultural level in terms of the people and what you provide and teach them and so forth. That sometimes they have the experience of worth and value and dignity from how you are relating to them. Uh, so it's a very similar process as in therapy. Yes. Since it seems like this problem is so tenacious, do you actually see people moving out of their, I'd like to say, birth quadrant, if you will? Yes. And how, mm, you're an expert, so what percentage would you assign to that? I don't have statistics on percentages, but the, the amazing thing is some people grew up in situations that you can't believe that they feel okay about themselves. I had a client um, who was blind. When she was about two years old, uh, she did something to, to upset her mother, or her mother got upset about, and um, she poked her eye, one of her eyes out with a pencil. At about four, she did something else that the mother got upset, and she burned the other eye out with a cigarette. Now somehow, this young child realize that the problem was not her, that her mother was mentally ill. And she was able to, through all of that abuse, retain a really positive experience and a uh, sense of okayness about herself. And when she came to me for therapy, it was uh, something to do with raising her daughter. Um, she was one of the most loving, um, gracious 
person, uh, people that I've ever worked with. She was just a beautiful human being and had very much a sense of okayness about herself and other people. Now, how is that possible? You know, it's, it's just mind-boggling that kids can come out of situations like that and make decisions that really lead to them being very healthy. There are other kids who come out of wonderful parent situ parental environments and families who make very destructive decisions. So only half of it is what our parents are doing. The other half is how we experience it, how we interpret it, and the decisions we make about what we're going to do in light of that. And, um, you know, it has something to do with the resilience of the human spirit. Yes? Also, in my experience, um, in TA, where you had the permissions, that everyone has the permission to be, share, feel, think, any way they want, so then what I say to my clients is, you have every right to continue your life like that, if that's your choice. Right. With those choices you have, come these consequences. So if you want to continue, if you want to keep, you know, nothing changes if nothing changes. Right. So when I give someone permission to continue this destructive behavior, it almost gives them permission to change. That's right. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Good point. Other comments or questions? Well, if, uh, if, if a confused behavior of students can be turned around in two weeks, that's a clue. Right. <laughs> that confused behavior of, of big people can be turned around too. That's right. Yes. But would you say it would take longer for adults? It depends on how much they're entrenched in their behavior. And also, um, uh, the relationship you have with them. Uh, you know, one of the things that we are, more and more people are writing about, is how essential the therapeutic relationship is. Um, and... Um, Oftentimes, we believe we're having all this great impact by having all these razzle-dazzle techniques that we do. When often, it is the experience of being in a re therapeutic relationship and experiencing uh, fundamental okayness uh, that really makes a tremendous difference in, in the person's ability to change and rapidity of change and so forth. So. Yes. We be in the different position as one person uh, uh, for example in the morning i I feel I am okay and then an experience makes me feel that uh, I am okay, you are okay and then I am okay, you are not okay and you know this yes change. we will we will move around these existential positions based on uh, the situation, who we're dealing with, and um, how we've learned to feel about that in the past. Uh, uh, Frank Ernst used to draw a little blob in the middle of this diagram showing the relative amount of time that we spent in each position, and he called it the life blob. <laughs> um, and But we will move around these positions. There's usually one that's more familiar to us than any of the others, or maybe two of them. Um, but we know how to do the behaviors usually of all the different positions. And we, when we get really upset, you know, with somebody, we might feel like we're okay and they're not. Or when we get really intimidated by somebody, we might feel like we're not, they are. Or we might get very frustrated with somebody and feel like, um, they're not okay, and we're inadequate to help them, you know, whatever. Quadrant, I am okay, you are not okay. Uh, what is the main gain? Because... Uh, um, you there, there are two primary games that are played. Um, 
which are blemish, which is looking for fault in other people and pointing them out. And now I've got you, where we invite somebody to do something, we set them up to make a mistake, and then we say, see how incompetent you are? You know, and we, we get them in that way. Yeah. I want to uh, do one final exercise for this afternoon, and then we'll wrap it up for the day. Um, this is an exercise to experience the difference between what are called drama strokes and intimacy. Drama strokes are often used as a substitute for intimacy. And it's a way of kind of shooting up on excitement. And some people become drama junkies. Uh, they go after constant excitement and stimulation. It's, but it's a little like eating junk food. You can never get enough of what you don't need. The more you get, the more you crave, because it doesn't ultimately satisfy. It provide, at least it, it lets you know that you're alive, um, but it doesn't really nurture or fulfill you. So I'd like for you to again get a partner, and the two of you just stand up together. And uh, if you have rings on, take them off. And uh, Catherine, are you willing t for me to demonstrate this? So, s so stand up with your partner, just facing each other. I want to just right okay. anywhere. Is I was wondering where with the screen. Yeah, let's do it right here. Okay. So what I want you to do first is play the game you used to play as a kid uh, where you put your hands palm up and the other person puts their hands on the top of your palms and you try to slap the person's hand before they can draw it away and the person on top tries to pull their hands away before I can slap them like that and if I miss then I have to put my hands on top and she gets to try to slap mine. <laughs> So, uh, and if you, if you miss, you have to put your hands on top. So just do that for a minute and see what you experience. <laughs> You're good at this. <laughs> okay, so I haven't played this game. So, okay. okay, and then now you try to get mine. Is that mm -hmm. it? Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, you like that. Oh, oh. <laughs> so I have to put mine on okay, top. Okay, so now I... Okay. What? Okay, got it. All right. <laughs> now, why do we do this game? It's an example of drama strokes. Yeah, because I kind of want to get you back. Right. That's right. The exercises are great. Yeah. They're good. Fun. Thank you. Okay. You can stop. Well, will everybody give me your attention? So what do you experience as you do that? Yeah, there's lots of excitement and stimulation. The only problem is it hurts. <laughs> and you start wanting to get the other person back. That's an example of drama strokes. They're very exciting, but they're not very fulfilling. So, uh, what I'd like you to do now, if we can do it, is just make one big circle around the room and get shoulder to shoulder with the person beside you. So everybody shoulder to shoulder. If, if there's too much space, just take a step forward. Yeah. Now, what I want you to do is take a right face and give the person in front of you back massage.
I think I got a professional here. <laughs> so now do an about face and continue. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so which do you like better, this or the slapping? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, this is an example of the difference between drama strokes, which is all that excitement and stimulation that oftentimes people uh, seek out, but doesn't really nourish or fulfill or satisfy you, and uh, intimacy, which nourishes and fulfills and satisfies you. You know, after a while, you've had enough, and you're ready to stop. Um, you know, oftentimes we feel like we could just do this forever, or it could go on forever, but you will reach a point where you're satiated, and you're filled up for that time, and you're ready to stop, because it fulfills what you're needing at that moment. And that's the difference. Any questions about that? I want to wrap up here for today. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk about life scripts and then talk about how people, once they've decided on a life script, try to make the external world fit their internal belief system or script.